Welcome into the Skinny Podcast. It's the weekly Poe pre edition. I'm Richard Skinner, local 12.com digital sports columnist and editor with Rick Boring. As always, it's presented by Blake, the attorney Mason. We got a lot to discuss. The Reds are scuffling. The Bengals' schedule is out. It's an interesting schedule. I guess maybe they always are because it's all fresh and new and right before us, but this one is interesting to me at least. And I'm sure some college basketball and other things, including my favorite portion of the podcast. Where you can ask me a question on any topic, just go to the Twitterverse, the Xverse, hit up hit up the hashtag Ask Skinny Anything. Rick, I'm not gonna lie, I uh, I went to the uh, PGA Championship on Wednesday, the practice round at Valhalla. We're going back for the third round on Saturday. I knew Valhalla was a hilly course, but it uh, it kicked my ass pretty good. You feeling it, huh? I'm feeling it a little bit. You have to stretch out the hamstrings a little bit this morning. Yeah, I felt bad. An older lady, so so you got to get on a bus at you, you get on a bus at Freedom Hall. Um, the old Freedom Hall, um, and you bus about 30 minutes to the golf course. It's how they handle the parking situation. It's actually very efficient. Um, but going back yesterday, get on the bus, and some poor old woman comes up the steps, and she literally goes, I can't move. My legs are cramped. And I went, oh, no. We literally had to like lift her up to get her on the normal, and so she could shuffle down the aisle and get into a seat. Oh, uh, I, I don't want to do this, but how heavy was she? Not very. It wasn't that bad. Wasn't okay. That bad. So, I mean, the way you were setting the story up, I figured she was going to be 350 pounds. Well, I was going to, I, we actually, I should have gotten up and let her have my seat, but she was only like two seats behind me. And then uh, the last two guys that got on was, a, was an older guy in a wheelchair. And at that point I did get up. I said, you know what, sir, you can have my seat. I'll go to the back of the bus. What is this? Like the infirmary? I thought it was a golf event. Well, I'm telling you, I'm going to guess. And I feel like I'm in pretty good shape, even, even for my advanced age. Um, and I've walked golf courses my whole life, uh, you know, caddying for my daughter in different tournaments and walked some very hilly ones with a bag on me. Um, I, I gotta be honest that that course, that course is about as hilly as I've ever come around. Well, well hold on. What'd they do with the wheelchair guy? Then this whole tournament, what, what was he doing? Well, that's a, the, here, so here's the goofy part. So when he got off, right. When he got off, they didn't have a wheelchair waiting for him at the place he got off to go to his car. He goes, I'll just, I'll limp it. I'll limp my way there. I'm like, all right, guy. I, I, I'm so confused by this guy's life and how he's living right here. He yeah, uses yeah. a wheelchair, but also goes to golf events on hilly courses and Correct. then doesn't need a wheelchair when the day's over, which is nope. impressive. No, but he, he was, he was, he was, he was limping it, limping it pretty good, but I'm, I'm looking forward to going back on Saturday. All right. You doing that with the fam? Yep. Yep. Nice. Good deal. All right. Well, let's get to the Bengals. The schedule was released. Like you talked about came out on Wednesday night and among the highlights of the Bengals schedule were the five primetime games that they'll play this year. They got two Monday night football games, against Washington at home, and then at Dallas. They got two Thursday night football games. That's at Baltimore and at home against the Cleveland Browns. And they got one Sunday night game. That's at the New York football Giants. It'll be week three, Monday night against the Commanders. Week six, Sunday night against the Giants. Week 10, Thursday night at the Ravens. Week 14, Monday night at the Cowboys. And week 16 is that final home game on Thursday night against the Browns. Uh, Skinny, your initial thoughts when you saw this schedule released. So I, I haven't put the finishing touches on this. It'll be up on local 12.com at some point today on this Thursday, um, kind of analyzing the schedule. And I've always broken it down into the toughest three game stretch, the easiest three game stretch, you know, do a final prediction of likely wins, likely losses, swing games, all of that stuff, games that might be able to get flexed into prime time. They can have one more game flexed. Uh, the interesting part to me was I had a hard time picking uh, both an easiest and hardest three game stretch. It feels like there's, there's like easier game, hard game, easier game, hard. It, it just never felt like there were really three game stretches of, of that stuff, Rick. I thought it, it balanced itself out pretty well. I mean, you look early in the season. Now, listen, they got to get off to a good start. I mean, yeah. that, that first month you're playing new England with a new head coach and, and possibly a rookie quarterback in Drake may you're playing Washington and a new head coach, although Dan Quinn's been a head coach before. Um, and a likely rookie quarterback in Jaden Daniels. You're playing Carolina, which is arguably um, the worst team in the NFL. Kansas City's obviously in that first four game mix, but I mean, they're they're giving you three wins right out of the gate. To be honest with you, Skinny, you have to start three and one. And if you win one of at the Chiefs or home against the Ravens, you're four and one going into the Giants Sunday night game. Right. With you would think a good chance to be five and one at that point. I mean, if this team gets off to a five and one start. This city is going to be bonkers. Yeah, in fact, I, I picked the because again, I do this for the exercise. Um, you know, the easiest three game stretch I picked was the Washington at Carolina, Baltimore, and again, I'm putting Baltimore in that mix, full well knowing they're the defending AFC North champs. They beat the Bengals twice last season, but again, if I'm doing this in three game stretches, they are at the back end of arguably two of your easier games on your schedule, and it is at home, so I had to put that part in there. But yeah, um, and then the funny part is, then, the, then I got the toughest three game stretch 
was starting with the game at the Giants, just because it is a road game. It comes after the Baltimore game. Then you got to go to Cleveland, and then you got Philly coming here. Again, not an impossible three-game stretch, but to me, again, if you have to pick it, you have to pick it, right? So that was right. kind of the toughest for me that I ended up picking just because two of those games were on the road, one of those is prime time. But back to your initial point, you get through the that, that initial stretch of three and one into four and one against Baltimore. You're flying high going into New York on a prime time game and, and a chance to win that. Um, you know, you've played toe to toe with Cleveland. Uh, you know, they're not impossible to beat on the road. I, I do think it'll be tough, but uh, you know, and, and then who knows the sky might be the limit for where your season could go. So it, it, it's, it's an interesting schedule in that regard. I know it's the NFL and there's a lot of parody and always unexpected results, especially early in the season. But just looking at the way it sets up, I mean, really, this team has had some tough starts to the season the last few years since Joe Burrow's gotten here. If they could just get one clean runway here to begin for the first five or six weeks, I think the whole city would really be feeling good. You know, they you mentioned they open at home against New England with a 1 p.m. Sunday game. That'll be on local 12. Um, you, you're talking about the hardest stretch of the schedule. I think a lot of people are looking at that three games in 10 day stretch in December where they play the Cowboys on Monday night, the Titans on Sunday, and then the Browns on Thursday. I don't think anyone looks at that as the three most difficult opponents, but the fact that they have to play those three games in a matter of 10 days. And I mean, look, the, the Cowboys are a difficult opponent on a Monday night primetime game. The Titans you're playing against a former member of your coaching staff who's going to be coaching that team and um, obviously Tyler Boyd. And then the Browns is always a very difficult game on Thursday night football primetime at home. So that stretch is definitely one that stands out to a lot of fans as well, I think. Yeah, I think the, the, the good part of that, though, is you get the home Thursday night game in that stretch. You don't have to go on the road for that Thursday night game. I, I considered that stretch for sure. Um, and maybe it is because it is three games in, in a 10 day period. And, 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 and maybe I can be talked out of that. Actually, now, now that we start talking through this, I may actually change my mind on that. Um, I just thought eh, the home Thursday night game kind of helps. How yeah. good is Tennessee really going to be? I know people are kind of high on them because they did a lot of things here in the off season, but you're also banking on Will Levis to be the man. And if he's not, what's your backup plan there? And I don't know what, what it would be for, for them. Um, so that's kind of why I didn't, but yeah, I mean, it is three games in 10 days. So that could arguably be the toughest three game stretch. Yeah, I think it's more there about the spot, really, than it is the opponents that you're playing against, but it, it that still matters. Sometimes the spot and the amount of travel and all of that is as important as anything. Uh, speaking of that, out of the league's 32 teams, I saw this graphic on, on Twitter last night, the Bengals will have the second fewest total miles to travel in the upcoming season, which just looking at the past years, that's been a big deal in the past. How much you travel does seem to impact your overall record. Bengals having the second fewest there and also playing a very favorable schedule this season. It, you would think it sets up well for them. Well, I mean, yeah, you got the last place teams. Tennessee was a light place finisher. That was, I mean, we always know that we know the schedule well in advance, but there's always a couple of open spots for light place finishers in a the division. They got the light place finisher in the NFC South. That's Carolina. Uh, at home, and then they got the light place finisher in the AFC South on the road, and that's at Tennessee. So you got technically a last place schedule. It's your time to take advantage of that. Yeah, I know we've already talked about it a little bit, but the the NFL also put out their own graphic where it showed every team's schedule ranked on opponent win percentage from last season. Right. The top three teams, most difficult schedules: the Browns, the Ravens, the Steelers. One, yep. two, and three in the NFL this upcoming year. So that has to help the Bengals out too. Bengals are sitting at 16th. So middle of the pack in terms of that statistic right there. Um, and, part of that, and part of that's inflated by the fact that the, of what the AFC North did. So some of that strength of schedule is that. And you're like, okay, those are they, they were terrible against the division opponents last year. They were one in five. Um, now's your chance to even that score a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And all, most of their schedule, their strength of schedule is coming from those divisional opponents. And obviously you have the Chiefs and the Eagles and the Cowboys in there as well. Uh, but Skinny, the one, the other thing that kind of jumped out to me, and you've talked about this a little bit already, a lot of new head coaches yeah. on the Bengals schedule this year. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And we already knew it going in, but it kind of uh, set in more, I guess, once I started going through this last night, if the schedule was released. Yeah, Gerard Mayo from New England, uh, Dan Quinn again from Washington. You've got uh, Jim Harbaugh with the, with the uh, with the Chargers. Um, who am I drawing? Tennessee. Brian Callahan with Tennessee. Yeah, so I mean, you're, you're right. There's there's a chunk of them there. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that I, I noticed. Oh, actually, I didn't notice. I saw Paul Fritchner had tweeted this out. My podcast partner on the Xavier side of things. He mentioned that uh, that weekend in December where you have the Monday night game Bengals at Cowboys. That Friday is the Xavier at TCU game as part of the Big East Big 12 wow. Challenge. So it'd be an extended weekend, but if you're a Xavier Bengals fan combo, it'd be a 
a pretty great trip to do TCU Friday, stay the whole weekend, and then go to the Bengals game on Monday well, night. Well, I already talked to my best friend who lives in Dallas, Texas. He grew up on the same street that you and I grew up on, actually probably three houses up from you on the same side of the street. Um, and I said, hey, will you be around that weekend? Um, I was thinking about maybe staying with you again and, and having a nice long weekend. He said, absolutely. I didn't even know that part of the mix. I might have to talk him into us going to the Xavier TCU game. There you go. That'd be a great way to start off the weekend on Friday night there before you hit the uh, town for a few drinks. But Skinny, any other thoughts here on the schedule? No, like I said, I go back to um, – it, it just feels like it's laid out very well for them, where, again, it's, it's hard to find – really hard stretches of games like, oh, my God, that month's going to be a disaster. How are you going to survive that month? It just feels like every time there's a tough game, it's followed up by, okay, that's an easier game on your schedule. Oh, yeah, that's a winnable game. Um, and, and to me, I, I think it lays out it lays out just great for them. They, they um, you know, I'm glad at least for myself and some of the people that cover the beat, especially those that are that are young parents, um, that they didn't get the either of the Christmas Day games. Um, you, I, I kind of like – I've always liked the buy in the middle. It just feels like it's just that goal of, hey, halfway through, halfway to go. I'm not hating it being as late as it is either. And I think it comes at a time where for them, it's a good time for the buy of you got to play that Thursday night game in Baltimore. It's kind of ironic how they pulled that off almost a year to the date of Joe Burrow's injury on a Thursday night that they play Baltimore at Baltimore. Then they have to make their longest trip of the season. You mentioned it, Rick. They don't have a lot of long trips, but their longest trip of the season is um, – at the Chargers that following Sunday. But again, they've got a, a nice window of rest after the Baltimore game for that. And then after that trip out West, you get the bye week off and then you play a home game. So again, I think it, it maps out very well for them. Yeah. And I think that's part of why that three game stretch in 10 days stood out to people so much because it's, it's, kind of nitpicking at that point. It's like, well, the schedule sets up pretty well for this team. I mean, if that's the complaint that we're talking about is Denver, I mean, excuse me, Tennessee in the middle of a your most difficult three-game stretch, it's not the worst situation in the world for a Bengals team. I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I that's, that's, and that's, again, that's why I, I debated that stretch. I'm actually, I think I'm going to go back and probably make that the toughest three game stretch. I, I went with that earlier stretch of games, but yeah, three and 10 days is a big ask in the NFL. There's not a lot of recovery time in there. Yeah, I think that's just the big concern about the way the schedule sets up. When you're looking for the worst part of it, it's like, well, that right there at the end of the season, if guys start getting banged up and all of a sudden you're on short rest and you lose a game you're not supposed to, could that send you into a downward spiral the last few weeks of the year? And I don't expect that to, but that, I mean, that's kind of a worst case scenario that I'm looking at right now. Yeah. And I mean, and, and the, the flip side to it also is, uh, you know, maybe Dak Prescott's hurt by that point or, right. or, you know, Will Levis again has played his way out of the lineup in Tennessee and they don't have an answer at quarterback. And Deshaun Watson was a the flaming disaster. We all think he's going to be and Cleveland's cashed it in by that, that point. But yeah, just again, the fact of three and 10 days is, is that's a big ask. Yeah. I mean, the reality of it is if you are playing Thursday night games, you're usually getting screwed over with that part of your schedule. Yes, I mean, a Thursday yes. night screws up your schedule. So everyone's looking at this like, oh, three games in 10 days. It's like, well, I, I don't even know how rare that is. When teams play Thursday night games, they usually get screwed in some way with the schedule. So it's not it's not that crazy, to be quite honest, but it definitely does seem to be their most difficult stretch. Skinny, one other thing uh, on the Bengals that I wanted to ask you about, Trey Hendrickson, who earlier this month threatened to retire if his contract wasn't restructured or if he wasn't traded, was on the field working out for the team on Monday as it began the second week of phase two of uh, off-season workout program. What are your thoughts there? Is this... Uh, He's a clown. He's a lunkhead clown. He's just a big, goofy lunkhead. <laughs> Listen, I wrote, a, I wrote a column right after he had this, this whole trade demand thing, and literally the, the, my lead was... His trade demand, your reaction should be, so what? I mean, he's got no, he had no leverage. I, I'm still trying to figure out what was the end game for these guys. You weren't going to get the Bengals to blink. They didn't need to blink. You didn't deserve to put them in the corner you thought that you were putting them into because they did you solid the year before. Just because you had a good year doesn't mean you get you get your contract retorn up. You had two more years on this deal. Probably at that point, they're going to let you walk in free agency. So go get your big deal then, dude. It, it was literally the dumbest hand played in the history of dumb hands played, whether it was by him through his agent or there was just the agent himself. Because um, the agent himself is the one who told Kelsey Conway, the inquire, well, maybe he'll just retire. Well, she wrote that. And then Trey gets all pissy about it and it tries to back her. Dude, you had a hand in this, my man. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I guess what I was trying to get out there that I wasn't able to say is, 
Is this about Trey Hendrickson just waking up one day and deciding he wants the entire city to hate him after all the goodwill he's built up over two years? Like, what was the point of this? Because he knew it wasn't going to happen. There was nowhere for it to go. The only thing he could possibly get out of this is losing goodwill with the fan base. And that's kind of what happened to some extent. I don't think it's it's a big deal with the fans, but some people are obviously disenchanted with him wanting to leave. Yeah, and I think he wanted to show by being there on Monday. That's when it was first shown. The media wasn't there on Monday, but, but the Bengals uh, videotaped it, tweeted it out, then he was there for the – practice on Tuesday and literally I didn't go bother to listen to him because I'm like I got somebody else I want to talk to I'm doing a story on another player I'm not gonna listen to your stupidity and and now all of a sudden trying to backtrack because even when you did I mean it was like it was such a clown show move you know the only way you're gonna win the fan base back and you will by your performance just go out and ball out and and that's what he's going to do but again I still the night that happened where I looked at my phone when I saw the tweet I went what does he do what is this all about I don't even I don't know what's more silly the fact that they did it or the fact that he's already back at OTA he's yes. working out with the well, team. No. This is this is the truth. So what they would I guess it was the Monday after the draft. I had a team official tell me that hey, you know, Trey's here today. He's 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 out work, he's working out in the weight room. I'm like, yeah, four days after he says he's gonna retire, he's back in the facility. What a goof. I mean, that's just so dumb to me. I and again I I don't care. Like Trey Hendrickson has been great. He's been one of the best free agent signings the Bengals have made. Uh, I love everything about them bringing him in. I'm glad he's still here and all of that. But it's just like, what were you or your people thinking a couple of weeks ago when you decided to start all this? Because it was never going to go anywhere. No, no. Again, they did him a solid last year. I was surprised they did that and extended him last year um, just because of some of the other monies that they needed to do. But they thought enough of him to give him another year, give him more money, give him guaranteed money on it. Um, You know, he had 30 million reasons not to retire the money he's going to make this year and next year. Um, he, I, I know full well he said that, you know, I got I got plenty of money. Well, OK, that's fine. But you're still not going to walk away from a game that you certainly appear to love playing and they're paying you pretty well for it. And listen, let's not forget when the Bengals signed Trey Hendrickson as a free agent, there were a lot of people that went, I just had one good year. What are you doing? Well, They calculated risk. It worked. It's worked out for both sides. They've paid him well. He's played well. And you don't get to all of a sudden after one great season in your contract, go, I'm done. Either pay me more or I'm done. No, dude, they're not going to pay you more and you're not done. So that's why I go back to my column was, so what? Yeah. That's what sucks about it. Cause it seemed like everything had worked out so well with this situation. It's like he came here, the Bengals bet on him. It worked out great for everybody. They even rewarded him last year because of all that. And then he still goes and does the stupid thing of like, I, I need out or I need more money. It's like, dude, just relax. Wait one more year. You owe the team who, who reads it. I don't usually take the player side in these types of, or the team side in these types of situations. I, I don't usually on the side of the player, but it's like, in this case, you just look like an absolute selfish, That's- greedy idiot. Correct. And that's literally the point I, I made in the column of I, I'm with you. I don't I very rarely will side with the team. Um, but in this case, they've done everything solid by this this guy. And he was like, you had no you were not going to retire, dude. I mean, even when he called Zach Taylor, Zach said, you're not going to retire. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's like your point. I mean, there, you could be talking to a billionaire. And if you tell him, hey, here's an easy 30 million next year for you. That billionaire is going to take it. So the whole like I have enough money thing is BS. An easy thirty million is an easy thirty million, and everyone says yes to that. That's just the yeah, way it is. Exactly. I, uh, I mean, and I just I thought, that's why I'm like I'm not even gonna go listen to this malarkey today. I'm gonna go do something. I'm gonna go talk to an, I'm gonna go talk to an undrafted rookie free agent, which is exactly what I did. <laughs> Good for you. The Bengals have uh, signed eight of their ten draft picks so far. Skinny. The only two I haven't signed are first round pick offensive tackle Amarius Mims and second round pick defensive tackle Chris Jenkins. Is everything else moving along there as expected? Yeah, yeah all that stuff is just slotting wise. It'll it'll come to fruition. Um, it, you know, it, it's just it, first rounders are usually the last ones to to get signed because um, it all kind of it all follows the slot. But yeah, I don't think there's going to be any any hold up and any hang up. It's kind of falling in in the order I figured it would fall. Did I miss anything on the Bengals this week? Nope. Uh, another day of another week of phase two of OTAs. They've got um, another couple of weeks of that and then mandatory mini camp in June. I guess that's the one will be interesting to see if if Jamar Chase uh, shows up. I doubt T Higgins will. Um, you know, T has not signed his franchise tag, so he's not under obligation to show up. I don't think he will. Uh, Jamar is under contract. So if Jamar doesn't show up for that, he would be fine. And I think Jamar is probably smart enough to realize that'll be a good three days for me to get some work in. No need for me to be up there right now. And I, I yeah, I, 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 I don't read into anything of Jamar being out other than Jamar just doesn't need to be here at this point in time. It's, it's voluntary. And I know you can argue, well, I need to work with Joe Burrow. He'll get plenty of work with Joe Burrow when the time comes. And, uh, and it, it, it's working out right now where Joe can work with some of the younger guys.
Yeah, I, I don't think those two need to work on their timing or chemistry yes. or anything. I think they've got that figured out pretty well. All right, let's switch gears to the Reds, who are two and five since we last talked. They're four and fifteen in their last nineteen games. Now they're sitting at eighteen and twenty-five, which is good for dead last in the NL Central, eight games behind the first place Brewers. The big news of the week is the insanely bad injury luck continuing for Cincinnati. TJ Friedel broke his thumb, and Nick Lodolo went on the 15-day injured list retroactive to May 12th due to a left groin strain. Skinny, what did you think of Ellie De La Cruz getting the day off on Wednesday with the team already being shorthanded? I get it. I, I mean, but, you know, you got to get a guy a day off at some point. I mean, it's a grind of its road trip. They don't have any days off on the road trip. Um, it's It's 10 games in 10 days. Um, he's been going from game one, uh, and at some point, there's just not enough energy in the tank. I, I know you can live on Pete Rose played all one. Yeah, okay, great. So did some other guys. And hell, Ellie still may play all every game this year. I, I, I get if you people are wringing their hands over that, but don't forget these are human beings too. And and he's gone at it pretty hard. And again, at some point, you got to say, hey, for your own good, we're giving you a, a day off. I, I will say, I, I hope we don't look back in retrospect in, in five years, Rick, and we're talking about what might have been with Matt McClain and what might have been with Nick Lodolo. It's just it's getting it's getting troublesome. Well, especially with Lodolo. I mean, we were already at that point before the season started when we were talking about him still trying to come back from that that stress fracture in his lower leg. And then he gets through all of that and he comes back and he's pitching great. I mean, really just it almost felt like we were going to erase all that stuff that we had talked about when the season started of him being injury prone and us being concerned about him ever being able to stay healthy and stay on the field. It's like, well, maybe that was, you know, maybe we were out over our skis and, and just being too negative about that. Maybe he's going to be fine because he looked so damn good there through those first three or four starts. And now we're back here with the groin strain and he's saying, Oh, it's, it's uh, preventative. I'm only going to miss three starts. It's just going to be a short little stint and everything's fine. I felt it. I pitched with it in the last outing. I pitched. Okay. But I just want to be cautious about this. Kenny, I don't trust them. I don't trust anything when the Reds say anything about injuries at this point. So, like, I when, when I hear it's just going to be a short stint on the DL, I think he's probably out for the year, basically. I mean, <laughs> that's the way it seems to go. Yeah, only time will tell. But, again, I I it just it, I hate to put the label on guys, but, man, it just feels like for him we're going to go, you know, you know what the best ability is, right? It's availability. Is he going to fall into that category? I sure hope not. Yeah, well, I mean, we're already kind of at that point. And to have another just kind of – I mean, I guess you – know, I guess the fact that it's a groin strain is better that it's not a severe injury, but it just feels like, oh, here's another nagging thing. It's always going to be something with this guy. Yeah, and can I say this too? I, and I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it. You know, last year was so much fun because of all the new guys coming up and the energy and all that. This team is downright boring. They are absolutely a bore to watch. Well, they have this weird situation going on right now where the two highest upside prospects in the organization, Hunter Green and Ellie De La Cruz, have actually played pretty well and are potentially blossoming into superstars. So in theory, that should be really fun to watch, and it should be kind of what we've all been waiting for. But the problem is the rest of the team, and I mean every other part of the team pretty much, has been terrible, and all the luck has been horrible. The injuries have been awful, and to your point, the offense has been so dreadful that the team has been incredibly boring to watch. They've gotten some really good pitching at times, but aside from that, it has been a boring Unfun team to watch if Ellie De La Cruz isn't making all world plays on every on a, every given right. night. And um I yeah, I don't I like it's it's a very weird season right now, to be quite honest. To be it watching is. it because in some ways the things that I really hoped for and really wanted to see happen are actually going well, and yet the season feels as bad as it can possibly feel right now. Yeah, that's well said. It, it was weird because like, like I said, I went to the PGA practice round yesterday. By the time we got back to the car, it was like 10 till six. And I uh, my daughter was driving. And I was in the back. She said, "Hey, will you turn on the Reds game?" And she turned it on, and said they were in the post game. And I looked at my phone real quick. I went, "This game's already, it is already over." An hour and fifty nine minutes. Then I looked at the box and went, "Oh, good, another three hit day for this club. Good for them." Yeah, it's. I mean, it's incredible, and you know, the people are getting worked up about them running themselves into outs and the base running. That stuff doesn't bother me near as much as just the concern over the lack of hitting. Yeah, no, mean, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the part. I, I think that's magnified, Rick, because they don't get on base enough. But I, I think, honestly, that's what's probably won them a handful of games that they probably would have lost otherwise. I agree. I actually think the base running stuff, I mean, if you look at the numbers from a base running standpoint, they're making things happen. They're yes. scoring runs that, honestly, they don't really deserve to be scoring with the way they're hitting. So um, I don't think the base running is an issue for this team. I don't think like they've lost 
the things that made them exciting and fun last year from that standpoint. They still have some of those guys. They're still trying to play that way when they are on base. But the problem is they're just on, not on base nearly enough and they don't get any timely hits at all when they are. So it's just, it's been brutal to watch the last three weeks. It has been. And, 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 that's the thing. It should be exciting because of what we've seen from Hunter Green, what we've seen when Nick Lodolo has been able to pitch, what we've seen from Ellie De La Cruz, and it's just not. Yeah, I mean, Hunter Green has really been fantastic to watch. He's pitching like the guy. And by the way, the Reds invested in him early. Like they've got him under control and they paid him money and probably got a good deal for him the way things are looking. The Hunter Green thing is actually looking like it's working out. And yet there's like nothing to be excited about right now. That feels so disappointing to me as a fan because yeah. it felt like that was going to be one we looked at. It was like, uh, maybe they made the wrong decision or maybe this worked out and everything went perfectly for the team. And well, it's looking like it worked out, but nothing's gone right aside from that. Yeah. It's frustrating. There's no question. Yeah. I did skinny. Sometimes when things get rough and I'm looking for answers and I'm trying to figure out what's going on, I turn to Reddit, the, the oh, collective sure. minds of the internet to see like, what, what am I really missing? And I did come across this thread, which I thought may have held the key to the, the Reds' success or lack thereof within it. it says this was a, a thread on Reddit. It said unpopular opinion. We have too many beefy players on our team. So naturally, oh. I clicked on that immediately. Huh. And the guy says, "I mean, I'm just saying, if we take the average weight across the league, we would come in heaviest." Do you think the issue is the Reds have too many fat players on their team? Uh, no, I think it's they have too many players who swing through strikes. I think that's the, the biggest part. They don't get hits. I would argue with this guy that the team is maybe too lean. Well, Jake Fraley lost like 10 pounds when he was sick. He said he needs to put, you know, put some of that weight back on. Listen, Mike Ford is clearly a beer league softball player. When you've got like the first three buttons of your shirt undone with the undershirt there, it literally screams, I belong at Rumpke, not a major league batter's box. And and who's healthy right now? Well, that's just it. Yeah. The fat leets are the healthy. Fat. You need more fat leets on your team. They don't get hurt. You can't pull fat. Correct. That's the great John Cruck line of all time. When a, when a female fan yelled at him, Cruck, you're fat. And he said, yep, you can't pull fat, can you? He's That's right. Ex it's exactly right. You need more fat leads like Mike Ford. That's what a ball player looks like. We don't need these guys that are under 12% body fat that have abs playing baseball. It's not necessary. It isn't. I, I, I mean, I, I, there might be some truth to that, to be quite frank. I I've always felt that way, especially with pitchers. I do not like skinny pitchers. I like fat pitchers. Position players can be a little different. Sometimes you need some athletes in the field occasionally, shortstop, up the middle. But uh, look, I, I disagree with this guy 100%. The Reds do not have enough beefy players on their roster, I'm with in you. my opinion. Uh, any other thoughts on the Reds, Skinny? No, like I said, it's just it just it's boring to watch this year. And, and maybe last year it just was – it felt like every guy that came up, there was new excitement around that guy, and then he'd provide a spark. And this year we're now down to the, oh, let's bring Mike Ford up. Okay, great. Well, that, that's the other issue, right? It's like there is no – next thing right as a fan it's not like you're waiting for something well it, another couple of weeks they'll bring this guy up or this guy gets it's like no there's just nothing i mean i guess you're waiting for Marte and mclean well, yeah and that's the thing i mean you're you're you're, you're gonna get Marte back um you know midway through you're hoping to get mclean back but by that time that that happens it may be way too late for any of it and yeah hopefully they start to play well and it gives you the rise for for what next season will be but this was a season i think we all thought this team had a shot to contend for the playoffs and yes the injuries have certainly derailed that but injuries aside, it's just the, the rest of the guys underperforming. It's just it's just not fun to watch. Yeah, and that might be the real question going forward. But maybe give it another few weeks here to let them get themselves out of it. But that could be the next question is, I, did I, we get too high on what we saw last year from some of these young Yeah, guys? and that may be, but I, I will say this. The, the one thing that will make some of your decisions in the offseason easier are, listen, we gave Will Benson an extended chance. We gave Jonathan Indy an extended chance. We gave just whatever other players you want to name an extended chance, and they didn't perform. And so guess what? Now we're looking elsewhere in the offseason. Yeah. All right, let's move to – well, we'll kind of combine college basketball and ask any anything here because we don't have any local topics, but we did have a national story that we got asked about by multiple people. And uh, we'll start it off like this. Our guy, Elliot Rearing, the Zebra, says, as a Horizon League expert, will you guard NKU's players' credit cards when Green Bay comes to town? Because Skinny, as you know, Doug Gottlieb has been hired as the new coach at Green Bay and will continue to do his radio show on Fox Sports, the nationally, syndic nationally syndicated radio show that he does daily. Uh, what are your thoughts here on Doug Gottlieb getting his first coaching job at Green Bay? I was, I was, I was assumed that this was going to come up, and I certainly wanted your take on it because it, you are the color analyst for uh, NKU games on the radio. I, my jaw hit the hit, when I literally I was scrolling through the internet yesterday. I was actually looking at NFL schedule leaks. 
uh, for some stuff. And all of a sudden I see that story pop up or whatever day it was a couple days ago. And I went, wait, what? And then instead he's still going to continue to do his radio show. I thought, Oh, this will be interesting. Cause here's the thing. If things go haywire there, it will be, well, you didn't devote enough time to, to, to your job. Flip side is if things go well for him there, um, you know, maybe it's, you guys need to stop spending so much time doing your job and do, do something. I, it's fascinating to watch. I, I do, Doug, just, you know, in doing games, I know he's certainly polarizing and the credit card thing always comes up. It's the easiest way to jab at Doug Gottlieb uh, for sure. Um, but I do really enjoy his basketball analysis. I clearly think he knows the game. I saw him actually play as a player at Oklahoma State. Literally, the dude, they used to run this offense at Oklahoma State. It was a bunch of pin down curls for, for, for guards and wings. He was the point guard. I've never seen teams back off of a guy more. He could literally, and I mean this, they would run their offense where he would dribble inside the top of the key looking for curlers, literally being given a free 15-foot jump shot, and he never took it because he couldn't shoot. That's crazy. I mean, looking at him, you would think he would be a shooter. I mean, just given the demographics and what we usually stereotype players as. Um, So being that I'm a broadcaster within the league in an official capacity, I am not going to talk about the fact that Doug Gottlieb stole his teammates' credit cards, used them. Um, That happened a long time ago. It would be unsavory of me to continue to bring up the fact that he stole his teammates' credit cards, used them, got in big trouble for that as a player, had to be exiled from his team at Notre Dame, and then uh, went to a junior college and all that. I don't want to bring that up personally. I don't want to make sure that everybody knows about that. And I personally probably won't talk about the fact that he stole his teammates' credit cards when he was in college. When when I'm broadcasting games, I won't do that. Uh, But I also think Doug Gottlieb has – uh, been an interesting polarizing guy on air for a lot of years. And there are now a lot of people who are waiting to see him fail. And they've been waiting to get this chance for him to be the man in the arena. Cause he's been taking shots at everybody else, right? Like players, coaches, his thing is like, he likes to call everybody out and he likes to be pretty negative about it. That builds up a lot of enemies. And so now he's going to be the one that everybody's talking about. And he's at a place where it's mm, they've had some success there, but it's not necessarily easy to win. You're at the right. mid-major level, and he's never coached. It's going to be brand new to him. I'm fascinated he to see how this coached, goes. He coached at grass, Grassroots AAU, though. Remind that's right, and yeah. like he helped with some international club yes, team the, or something. He mentioned yep, that's correct. That's, that's where correct. he learned to coach. He knows he knows this. He's already used to it because he's already coached this correct. international team. He said. Correct. Um, Skinny, I, I'm actually with you though. I think this is fascinating. I love it because there's only two things that can happen. One, he makes this work. And in that case, we have this whole new fun thing to look at of like, is there this world of like where influencers or media people or people with an online following or not not necessarily online, but just a a presence and a following to where they, they have a platform, a public platform to where they can market the program, they can recruit with that platform and they can bring in NIL dollars with it. If that works for him, then not only does it open up new ideas for who you might hire as your head coaches in the future. But it also, to your point, calls out all these phonies who have been talking about them sleeping in their offices, grinding film into the wee hours of the morning all these years, because this guy's doing a whole nother full-time job during the middle of the day and coaching his team successfully. So if he does that, then all of you other guys, what, what are you, what are you wasting your time for? What are you doing? Well, I mean, Dion kind of laid the groundwork for this a little bit. Now, certainly going to Colorado, he had head coaching experience at Jackson state, but really didn't have it until he went to Jackson state. And I think Dion's a phony baloney used car salesman. And I I'm waiting for this to fail at Colorado, which I think it will eventually, but it, it, it I think it allowed, it, it maybe opened the door for others to say, listen, this guy's making it work at the moment. Again, even what he did last year at Colorado was a huge improvement over what Colorado was a year before. Now everybody got over their skis after they were three and oh, Oh, look, he's going to win. No, he's not. They're going to finally lose. And they did. They wound up losing a bunch of games. I went up, up losing eight of their last nine games for goodness sakes, because he, he didn't have enough talent, but nobody's expecting that guy to come in and do eight and four after the team was and 12 or one and 11 the year before, but it did open the door a little bit to stuff like this, right? It did. It changed it. And then the other side of this is he fails and everybody just rips him and makes fun of him and becomes a laughing stock, which is also going to be fun because quite honestly, he's been kind of a jerk over the years. And I don't think a lot of people are out here looking to defend Doug Gottlieb. So right. It's an interesting hire. I and, have and no listen, idea. I gotta give him going. credit. I mean, he's he's chasing whatever whatever coaching dream he's got, and he's now willing to put himself in the arena. I admire that. I give him some credit for, it. and I I don't know if Green Bay deserves credit for making this hire or not, 
but it's interesting. It takes some balls. I mean, I, I, I didn't realize until I started reading the story, Rick, and maybe you did or didn't. I, I, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here. I didn't know they were they were pretty well down the road to to maybe hiring him on the last cycle. So I didn't know that they were very far down that path. I did know that he was interested, that he had reached out, and uh, he's been trying to get jobs not just there but other places. I think yeah. Green Bay is just a spot where he had the previous connection, so he felt like that was a spot where he really had a chance. Um, I'm a little surprised because I know like they came after John Brandon pretty hard last time when they were when they were making this hire and they went with Sundance Wicks. Um, so the great fact name, that they ended up great, what a name too, by the way. Sundance Wick. I mean, how about that guy? He goes for one year, brings over like a player of the year candidate who barely lost out because he got injured. He lost out to Trey Townsend. But really, he had the player of the year on his team at Green Bay for one year. They have this big turnaround. They flounder down the stretch. They lose in the quarterfinals of the Horizon League tournament. So they go nowhere with that great turnaround season that they had. And then he bolts at the last minute to Wyoming after the transfer portal closes. I mean, just a brutal instance for this Green Bay program to have to to go through again after they thought they had found their guy and they were back right. on the right track. They're, they're right back here. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how this works out. It is a major swing by the green Bay administration. Yeah. I, like I said, I, I had to do a double take when I first saw that. I thought, wait, where's the joke? Where's the punchline to this? No, there's no punchline. This is really happening. Do, what, what's your best guess in terms of like, do you think it works out? Do you think the radio thing is okay? Or do you think he's like, has to k- put the kibosh on that a few months in? I do. I, I mean, it, it, for someone who did that and worked another full-time job on top of doing radio full-time, it's a grind. I, I know people may not think that, but three hours a day, five days a week is a grind. Um, and so I remember those years for myself personally, doing two jobs at once. It wore me to a pulp. Now, I certainly enjoyed cashing two full-time job checks for a while, um, and, and that was a good thing. And we were a fledgling family at that point, so it was worth the while. Um, but I I. I'm going to say no. I mean, I'll use myself. I mean, I'm a high school coach, so I certainly don't spend time grinding grinding as much tape as college coaches do um, and all those things. But it, it the season for me is a grind. I love doing it. Um, I love it as an assistant. I don't have to do all the stuff to run a program. I just think all the stuff that you have to do to run a program, I think that's the coaching part to me is the easy part. It really is. Breaking down film, that's the easy part. The hard part is running the program. And I think that's going to require more full-time work than he thinks. Yeah, Doug Gottlieb, 2 o'clock hour coming right up. Uh, next, we're going to talk to our assistant coaches. We have a coaches meeting here that we didn't have time to get finished. So <laughs> if you don't mind, you guys are just going to sit in and listen to us as we talk about recruiting for the next 15 minutes here. I mean, like, so what, what are we doing? It's great. I, I just don't know how he's going to pull it off. Uh, all right. Next question from David here. I'm turning 45 this year, and I'm not making it to 90. Great to hear. Okay. Which means I'm at least halfway through it. What's your favorite part of being on the back nine of life? Um, I, I will say this as an empty nester. It is the fact that whatever money's coming into our household now, pretty much other than, than the expense, the, the, the living expenses, there's no more, um, there's no more golf that I have to pay for. There's no more, um, lessons for this that I have to pay for children's clothes that we have to pay for. That's the nice part to me. I Hair, love my kids. Nails, prom dresses. Correct. correct. Oh, you had um, it rough. I love my girls. I, I love them to death. Um, and I'm going to see my youngest in Florida where she works in a, in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to that. Like I said, I went to the PGA with my oldest. Um, she's about to have our first grandchild. So I love them to death, but it is, it's quite interesting now where you look and you go, huh? God, look at all the money we used to we took off high school tuition. I mean, <laughs> yeah. what, my wife, my one daughter went to a Catholic high school. My other one went to high school and pay, we paid tuition for her to go to that high school. So there's the tuition expense for that. There's college expense. I mean, yeah, that's that's the best part of the back nine of life, my man. My parents had five kids, and we're separated pretty far apart. So there's o- there's only like a couple years where they had four tuition. They were paying Catholic tuitions for four <laughs> different kids at once one year, and that, that only happened for a couple years. But like uh, most of the part, they were stretched out, and they weren't paying them all at the same time. But imagine that four Catholic tuitions at the same time. Oh, but they'll tell you, you get, the, you get the extra child discount. Yeah, you got to get the bundle deal there from St. Yeah. Pius. Yeah, 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 it's not much of a discount though. Yeah, did you uh did you watch the Tom Brady roast? Can you wrap? I did up not. I did not. I didn't. I see, I see. He now has regrets over doing it. Shut so up. that's that's Shut actually. The, I didn't watch it either. But this was my only thing I was going to bring up is he's doing the thing that I absolutely hate. If you're going to do something like this, which is fine, it's great. I'm not a big roast guy, but it's fun. It shows a good side of you. But you can't go back afterwards and be like, oh, I don't like what it. I don't like how it made my kids feel and all that. Dude, so, like, dude you you volunteered to be for the roast. Roasts are raunchy. That's what yes. they are. You're going to get some uh, some some 
less than colorful jokes made at you, about you, said to you. And yes, they did say, keep the kids off limits. That's fine. I, I think that's And they fair did thing. that. And they did that. Yeah. I yeah. think that's a fair thing to, to ask and a fair thing for people to comply with. But everything else is on, on, there's nothing else off limits, bro. Right. It's like you're you're a divorced guy. You got million tens of millions of dollars from Netflix to do that. You're, you're a divorced a guy and let people take of, you're a bit of a goof. Yeah, and people took pot shots at your ex-wife for a couple hours. Don't act like you didn't like that and like you didn't know what you were signing up for. You knew exactly what that, that was going to be. You asked them not to take shots at your kids. They didn't. And now even after the fact, you're gonna be a baby about it and be like, Whoa, I didn't like how it made my kids feel. Buddy. Look, you can't have it both ways. If you don't, if you don't want your kids to be involved in stuff like that, you don't want them to have to deal with the public backlash, then don't do it. You're the one volunteering to be on Fox's NFL broadcast next year. You're the one taking $30 million from Netflix to have a roast about you to be the center of attention for an entire night. If you don't like that stuff, say no. You don't have to take the $30 million. I fully agree. Go eat I can't broccoli. stand this new stuff with everybody complaining after the fact. I agree with you. No, I'm with I, I again. I didn't see it. I know some of the raunchy things that were said. That's what roasts are, man. That's literally what they are. Yeah, and again, you asked for it. I mean, yes. I know someone came to you and asked for it, but you can say no. You don't have to be a part of that if you think like, hey, I'm not going to like this afterwards. But you do like the publicity. You do like the fact that it makes you look more normal when everyone thinks you're a robot weirdo and you're about to be on CBS or uh, Fox's broadcast of the NFL, the upcoming season. So you're trying to get your personality out there a little bit more. It's benefiting you, my man. That's why you did it. And that's fine. But don't go back on it afterwards. Agreed. All right. That's all I got. All right, I like it. <laughs> good, good, way to, good way to end it. All right, we'll be back next week. For Rick Roaring, I'm Richard Skinner. It's been the Skinny Podcast, the weekly potpourri edition presented by Blake, the attorney, Maislin. You can always get local stories right here on YouTube, but go ahead and hit that subscribe button to get notifications to stay in the know.